Um, Jonathan Bidlack joins us now, director of the governance program at the R Street Institute. Some people think this is a scam. President Biden's latest action on student debt. Good morning, Jonathan. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for taking the time. So th- this seemed to uh, to me have fallen between the cracks of the news. I don't know if a lot of people noticed it or not, but l- take us back to give us some context. The initial plan was for the Biden administration to forgive how much in student debt and then what happened with the Supreme Court. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, the basic cost was estimated to be about four hundred and twenty billion dollars by the Congressional Budget Office, which uh, is, of course, a, a lot of money and would have been a one time forgiveness. Uh, the Supreme Court essentially found that uh, the president didn't have the authority to do that, which, frankly, is what I think most people expected. I mean, you know, Nancy Pelosi herself had literally said that in the past, that, that no president had the ability to, to just uh, just unilaterally forgive debt, uh, student debt without without a congressional authority. Uh, the case basically hinged upon uh, the HEROES Act, which had authorized some very limited forgiveness, and uh, they were essentially trying to utilize that to, to forgive more broadly, and the Supreme court essentially said no uh that, that's not allowed and so uh so so here we are so what does he intend to do now with um and can he do it legally right so let's take i guess the first first part of that question first um so so essentially what they've done is you know the the department of education has a whole series of of uh rules or internal procedures in terms of how how they deal with repayment of student debt um and a, a lot of that is based on you know the income of the borrower uh at, you know at once they're out of school and so um essentially uh rather than saying we're going to forgive debt uh, outright, what they've done is started to make a number of adjustments to uh, the income repayment requirements that that they have for borrowers. Um, And so while that's not strictly uh, forgiveness, um, the the changes that they're making are much more... um, uh, shall we say favorable to to people who have who have federal student loans, and so the the estimates now from from this uh, these sort of changes that are being made are that the costs may end up being relatively close to uh, what the one time forgiveness would have been. I mean, you know, the, the University of Pennsylvania I think estimated the cost of of, of these new measures um, around three hundred and sixty billion dollars, and and the forgiveness was was you know. 400 to 420 billion. So, um, so essentially, that's what's happening is they're making these kind of changes. They're trying to go and be more favorable to borrowers as a way of of uh, forgiving a you know perhaps a roughly equivalent amount of, of student debt. I don't want to get too much in the weeds here, but the devil is in the details. So, who would qualify for this this new plan? Yeah, I mean, basically anyone who has uh, federal student loans, um, and there are ways, of course, for people who have private loans to, to you know, roll them in or whatever. But, um, but uh, you know, the, the people who are going to benefit the most are those who are generally making less money when they when they come out of school. So, for example, you know, there's a threshold that the Department of Education uses. Uh, to determine whether or not you don't have to go and, and, you know, pay back anything immediately, well, that threshold is going up. Um, so people who are at, the, the again, the, the lower end of the income spectrum, you know, are going to end up not having uh, not having to pay. Um, the other, the other uh, uh, I think, group of people who will, who will benefit a decent amount um, are those who, um, well, again, are in that in that next cut here. I mean, you know, if you're if you're paying, but you're not paying the full amount, um, you won't actually have interest accrue, which is essentially giving people an interest free loan uh, when they're out. So, so there are these sorts of things. There are people in these different kind of groups uh, that, if they hold student loans, will end up uh, will end up benefiting under under these new rules. Is this subject to legal action, and is anybody likely to challenge this in court? I think it's absolutely going to be challenged, uh, n- no doubt about that. You know, whether or not it is uh, quite as as uh, susceptible as, as the, the, the one-time forgiveness one was uh, is anyone's guess. I mean, you know, they're, they're using authorities uh, under, under a different law here, the Higher Education Act. And so, so you know, the, the legal analysts have basically said that, that it, it may be less susceptible to a challenge. That, of course, does not mean that there will not be a challenge and that ultimately uh, the Supreme Court will not find similarly. I mean, 
I think the, the challenge here is that everyone kind of knows what they're doing and why they're doing it, um, but it may perhaps end up being a more, a more you know, sort of uh, legally uh, advisable way. But, uh, you know, that I think will ultimately come down to what the Supreme Court decides uh, once a challenge is brought. So in the meantime, what do, what do the people that are affected by this do? Do they... Do they make the reduced payments, or do do they? And then will they have to, if the court rules against them? I'm just wondering, practically speaking, we got to take a break here, but we can pick it up here when we come back. And all of this seems, you know, like either a good or a bad idea in theory. I'm just wondering about it actually being carried out, and 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 what the process would look like, and. and Seven twenty-four and a half. Tommy Tucker, WWL, talking to uh, Jonathan Bidlack, director of the governance program at the R Street Institute, about the Biden administration's latest um, plan uh, to forgive student debt. And again, just to recap here, this is about income-driven repayment plans, correct? That's right. And the number I saw was eight hundred four thousand students and thirty-nine billion. But you're saying that thirty-nine billion is low and it could go up to like almost 360 billion well i mean this is just the first step right so so this is essentially a, a, an, an adjustment that the administration is making to kind of uh you know what they say is you know wiping out certain loans and, and, and fixing various mistakes made by loan servicers. Uh, but this is this is really the first step in a broader plan to to implement, again, new rules that will adjust, um, you know, how uh, what what the what the repayment requirements are uh, for for people who have who hold student debt. Yeah, it seems as though you can look at it as, OK, well, look, you wanted the big college experience at, at uh, pick a school, whatever it is, uh, Yale or, or Stanford or whatever. And you could get in or, or Wake Forest, pick one. I don't care. And, and uh, you had it and you pledged gamma, gamma, gamma. And you went to the football games. You had a good time. Now you got a degree in French literature and you owe one hundred thousand dollars. I'm sorry, but you signed the papers. You should have realized that going in. Some would make a case that you should have known the deal going in, and now you owe the money. Others would make a case that, no, this was predatory lending. People didn't realize what they were getting into. Where, where is the truth in that? Well, I mean, I think that's a good summary. I think it's, you know, a little from column A and a little from column B. I mean, you know, certainly, I mean, I don't think anyone should really be uh, unfamiliar with uh, how, how a loan works uh, if, if you're taking out a loan. Uh, but obviously there are aspects where where it is perhaps a little bit predatory you know from from my standpoint i think there there's another important question here which is not just what makes sense from a policy standpoint uh, but but also, you know, who has the authority to do this? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if if people think that student debt forgiveness in one form or another uh, is a good idea, um, then I think it's pretty clear that that is something that Congress ultimately needs to be involved in and not just, you know, a president unilaterally deciding to take this kind of action. Uh, you know, we've seen this uh, increasingly where, where presidents from both parties use executive orders that, you know, then get overturned when a new president comes into office or what have you. Um, and it's, it's largely, you know, not the way that the Constitution was intended to have our government operate. And so, so aside from this question of, you know, is it a good idea to forgive, there's this other question, too, which is who should ultimately be responsible for deciding that in the first place. Yeah, and you're reading ahead because that was my next question. How likely is this to be turned or overturned or changed for um, yeah, the next administration, for whatever reason, we have a Republican administration, and then all of a sudden these people had thought their loans had been adjusted. Well, can the new president go back and re readjust them where the money is in fact owed? Yeah, and and in fact, under this new the new sort of rules and the new system that the the Biden administration is is looking to to implement, um, that definitely would be susceptible because you know unlike a one time forgiveness where you know once it's forgiven it's not like a, a you know a president can go and, and reinstate it, um, 
when you're talking about the different you know, the sort of structure under which uh, the Department of Education is requiring that borrowers pay back their debt, um, well, of course, a new administration could come in and say, actually, we don't like those rules. And and frankly, you know, the, the other part of this is that if that were ultimately ruled uh, constitutional, um, th- th- then future administrations could kind of go and, and, and do willy nilly wh- whatever whatever they like. I mean, some of these various income thresholds, for example, that are that are particularly favorable to borrowers at the lower end of the uh, income spectrum once they're out of school, um, those could be could be wiped out or completely completely changed in a way that is that is unfavorable to uh, to borrowers. And so, you know, there's a little bit of I think playing with fire here when you're doing things in this unilateral way uh, rather than having having a uh, broader buy-in from, from lawmakers. And this is not really either Republican or Democratic president seizing power. This is Congress kind of ceding the, ceding the power to them. He ceded power, or more often than not, just sort of passively allowed the executive to take on more power. And, and that's a phenomenon that we've seen regardless of, of party. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Jonathan Bidlack, Director of the Governance Program at the R Street Institute. We come back, we take a look at the week ahead on Wall Street, Monday morning markets with Mark Rosa, President and CEO of Jefferson Financial Federal Credit Union. I'm Tommy Tucker. Time for news now, WWL.